Hi. All right. Well, thanks for bearing with me on a, on a hot day. Um, and and uh, one thing I thought about, just to start, to give you a little bit of context about what we do and, and, and who we are, so you can put it in context. We're a product group, not, not, not a research group. And so the context, the, the thoughts I have go in that. And our mission is really, really simple. And it, I observe that this is true about all technology companies. I know it's true about Google. My guess is it's true about wherever you work, which is there's this fundamental tension when you talk about innovation, right? So on the one hand, we all know you got to innovate. There's no company in the world you walk up to and go, should we innovate? They're like, no, that's just crap. So we all know you need to innovate, and everybody talks about innovation, but not that much goes on. And why doesn't it go on? It doesn't go on because there's a countervailing threat. And the countervailing balance that balances out this is simply this. What if I'm wrong? What if I innovate on the wrong thing? What if I screw up my product? What if it costs too much money? What if I do it? And fear two always beats fear one. And the reason fear two always beats fear one is because fear two is quantifiable and it will happen this year. If I blow this year's launch by putting something innovative and nobody wants it, I'm fired. I don't have to worry about year two, right? And yet, if you think about it, the insidious danger is actually fear one because if you don't, succeed on the innovation front, then each year you, that you think you can make it up, you fall further and further behind. So our job is actually to mitigate that risk. That's the entire focus of my group. Uh, we do it. I am a firm believer that you don't do it by PowerPoints and slides. I'm sure you guys are dying for more PowerPoint and slides on a, on a sunny French day. Um, I don't, I'm not a huge believer in prototypes. I think they're helpful to do a thing. I think you actually have to ship a product. Now, you can do it at low scale, and that's what we do. So we build something all the way up because it's not just about retiring the engineering risk or the mechanical risk. It's the business case. It's the legal case. It's the use cases. It's what the licensing is. It's evidently GDPR, which I now know more about than I ever want to know. Um, I did something horrible in some life, and now I have to go to GDPR meetings. I don't know exactly what it was. But so if you realize that this thing is important, you realize that, you, the idea that you pick, the one you want to go after, is, probably, is one of the most important decisions you'll make. And we get, and I'm sure you do too, we get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ideas, and the question is, how do you filter through? How do you pick the one that makes the most sense? And I'm going to show you this because, and it's kind of fun to give this talk. I only gave it because Zoe asked. I've never given it outside. Um, we did this thing, um, and you'll be, you'll be alarmed because the questions I'm going to ask are incredibly simple. There's just five of them. Um, so it's, it, we ask these five questions. I'm going to run through them in, in, in detail. They're deceptively simple. I can ask them in about 30 seconds. It takes most of my PhDs in, who are running uh, in, in my projects on an average of three to six months, sometimes nine months to answer these. And I'm going to just try to, my plan today is I'm going to walk through these, these questions, give you a couple examples of them, and then I'll show you exactly how it applied to our products and products we shipped. Because I never like when people just talk and you're like, okay, but... What did it actually resolve on? So let's start with the first one. Seems really easy. What's the problem? But it is amazing how often we get that wrong. So a lot of times people will come up and they will tell me about a cool technology. Graphene is really cool. Carbon nanotubes, wow. Those are not problems. Those are cool technologies that are fun to play with, but those are not problems. The other kind of problems you get are hyper-technical problems that only somebody buried in your industry would understand. You know when you're trying to map IPv6 to IPv4 and then you've got a problem with a linked list and then you know, like everybody's already fallen asleep. The problems I'm looking for is something you should describe in one sentence. It should be obvious, it should be undeniable, it should be indisputable, it's like obviously a problem. I don't know, die, hunger is bad, dying of hunger is worse. Anybody want to take the other side? Right? Okay. So that's the point of what's the problem. It should be an immediate and obvious problem. If you want a simple one in my head, I always think about bad Jerry Seinfeld routines, right? You know, don't you hate it when, if you can do that, you have a good problem. So that's step one, come up with a problem. The second part is what's the state of the art? And people miss this all the time too. You are not the only person, I, and if, if this hurts people's feelings, I am sorry. You are not the only person to think about this problem. If you are the only person to recognize this problem, go back to number one, you have the wrong problem. There's a small chance you're Einstein, but you're probably not. So what is this problem that everybody knows and what is the state of the art? And here's the key on state of the art. It's not state of the art today. You need to project out over the next five years because the people you're, that you're trying to beat, they're not stupid. They're already ahead of you. They've already built the product. So if you're not jumping ahead, it doesn't work. 
So I get a lot of pitches where they go, see this competitor X's product, they messed up, I can make it better. I'm like, they know that too. <laughs> They're gonna make it better too, they read the same reviews you do. What I need to understand is how we're gonna jump ahead, how we're gonna get a generation or two ahead. So that's the second question, not what state of the art, but what is it in five years? The third slide is the most fun one, it's the arrogant slide. It is the thank God for me slide. It is your chance to beat your chest. And what you say basically is, these people, meaning all the state-of-the-art people, have the problem wrong. They don't understand. They, they're looking at the solution the wrong way and it's never gonna close. Thank God for me, I know the right answer. And what's really lucky for me is I don't ever have to be that guy, I just have to hire those guys, so it's pretty easy. Uh, and they do come in the office all the time and tell me, thank God for them. And I'll give you some real specific examples in a minute, but I just wanna walk through the framework. Fourth one is, so, okay, you have a great problem. You understand the state of the art. You're the freaking genius, that's awesome. So why hasn't somebody else done this before? Is there some, can you show me some existence proof? Something that exists somewhere, whether that's an academic article, or maybe it's been used in another industry, or it's been done at small scale, but something that gives me hope, right? And then the fifth one is the one that everybody loves the most, budget and schedule, but actually it's important. We as human beings do better with big old scoreboards. And you need a big old scoreboard to tell you what you're doing. So my plan is I wanna know within two years today, you tell me if I give you this money and this headcount in two years, put a stake in the ground and I want a bold claim. I will reduce world hunger by X percent. Now I know it's scary and I know you're probably wrong and I know the schedule probably is all messed up. But if we don't commit, these things bleed on forever and ever and you need to keep yourself honest and you won't remember. And so one of the tricks we have in my shop is you put your original schedule, we put it up on the wall and that's what it is. And I know that it's gonna be wrong, but that's okay. That schedule's there, that never comes down. When you wanna change things, we have a new schedule, that's fine, it gets posted right below. And then the next one below and the next one below. And the reason you do that is because otherwise you get a boil the frog problem. You know, oh, I'm only off by 10 days. Like, why are you being so aggressive? Come on, man, 10 days is not much of a slip. That's true, but if you have like 40 of those, quick math in your head, you're off by over a year. And so you wanna watch that the whole time so that you can ask yourself and the team questions like, wait, I thought this was gonna take three months. This thing is taking nine months. Why do I believe that the next step that I said will take three months is not that? And maybe we have to rejigger. So I'm gonna give you two quick examples of how it works and then I'll show you an uh, actual one. So since I did hunger, let's take hunger as the one. So hunger, good problem, right? Easy, right? Okay. Um, what's state of the art? State of the art is we're trying to grow more food per acre, um, uh, genetic crops, uh, better fertilizer, better water, uh, more seeds, better resistance, that kind of a thing. But, and, and this is a well-known fact now, but imagine for this example that you didn't know it, that actually the truth is there's enough food to feed the world by, by quite a bit. The problem is the distribution problem. But if the world didn't know that, that would have been your three aha. You'd say, see, everyone thinks it's about doing food. That's not gonna cut it, it's about distribution. Your existence proof would have been, hey, here's what, um, I saw it in other goods and I've seen where there's a supply demand problem and look, it worked over there and there's no real reason I can imagine that it wouldn't, if it works for this, it wouldn't work for food. And then your little to your schedule might be, hey, I picked three towns in Africa and a food distribution place and I'm gonna go build a little railroad between them and we'll see. And if it works, then it's easy to hit the button and fast forward and go and, and, and then accelerate and we've, we've mitigated that risk and we can go innovate, right? Here's one where it doesn't work. And I would love to tell you this is a made up example, but alas, it is not. Um, although I am fair to say he or she no longer works for Google, so that was good. They came by and they said, I have a great problem. The problem is it's very difficult to ship goods, mass amounts of stuff from point A to point B. And I was like, yes, go on. And then they said, well, the problem is, and state of the art is it's all about energy density. That's just fancy engineering talk for basically, look, I can ship big heavy things slowly through the water or I can ship light things on an airplane, but at eventually it's the same sort of cost, pound per amount of energy and that's what it is. And what people are trying to do is make better materials, lighter aircraft, uh, better batteries, but it's a very incremental growth. And I was like, this sounds great. And, he, and then the person comes up and he goes, so what's your solution? What's your high? He goes, teleportation. We can just beam stuff from here to there. And that's when you take that little half step back, right? You're like, uh-huh. And, and okay, what's that existence proof? And it turns out they watch a lot of Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, so that was the end of that one. But hopefully it gives you an idea of the process. So I'm gonna show you a real one. This is something we did. Um, 
one of my uh, one of my project leads, Ivan Puparev, who's uh, off the chart brilliant, um, was obsessed with wearables, and 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 he hates wearing those watches. And he, he's Russian. I can't do justice to it, but it was like, damn, I hate these these big plastic square on wrist, I, right? And it was like, yeah, I got it, but that's not a program. That's not a problem. Like, what is it that I want? Why why are these things not taking off? We all want that capability, but we're not really enamored with it. And so we had to go back to first principles and we came up with this chart. So this is based on work by Fitz in 1954. I, I, I don't know if anybody knows Fitz. If you don't, I would actually commend you to read the article. Uh, it was done in 54. It's actually a very, very brilliant mathematician who applied stuff to design. And what he said is quite simple. He was trying to map the amount of energy it takes from your brain through to your hand in order to do an action. And you can actually see it in all sorts of products today. And, and, and the obvious conclusion of it is, is that things that are larger and closer to you are easier to target than things that are smaller and further away. Every time you get in an automobile, you see fits its principle. That's why you have a large square uh, brake pedal and a skinny little gas pedal, although evidently they've reversed it on the streets here in Cannes. But for most people, that's the way that is supposed to work. And so what this red line here is, is the calculation of how much energy and effort it takes so as things get smaller, what got cut off here on this axis is, is size. So this is size, and this is the amount of energy it takes. And this is Fitz's line right here. This is the limit of human capacity. This is the most that a human being can do. Yvonne w went back, we redid the experiment, and it's actually a little bit lower. But here's where it got interesting. We then mapped your tablet, your cell phone, and your watch onto this continuum. And what you see is something very interesting. The watch is right here at the human limit of what you can actually control. And if you think about it, you're seeing it already in the products. You see it all the time. Because either you have to get a small device that only does a couple of things, but it does this very well, but it doesn't really do everything you want it to do. Or you wear this big old stupid clunky thing that does lots of things, except you can't ever get, hit the icons. Because your hand is just fundamentally bigger than the glass and it's just not a great experience. So if you have that insight, it immediately tells you two things. If I'm going to get into wearables, I ha something has to change, right? I have to go on the x-axis or the y-axis. So either I have to make the surface area very, very large, or I have to disassociate from the, f from the surface, right? And both of these turn into products. So the first one, we call it Jacquard. So our first thought was, OK, we need a really large interface. But nobody wants to wear that like, you know, Star Wars thing of you know, like the entire, your arms and LED, right? And you're actually seeing it today. If you've been watching watches, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. They're bigger and bigger and bigger because of this chart, right? So it's, if you want to crack this market, it's not about rose gold and Hermes band. It's about fundamental math and fundamental science, right? So what we realized was, well, wait a minute. Why do you call this thing, that, this, this, this watch thing, why do you call it a wearable? Anybody know why you call it a wearable? There's absolutely no reason. It's just tech people making up words for crap, right? Your dad did not buy a brand new Rolex and come home and go, baby, Check out the wearable. Like, never happened. We just made this up. We know what wearables are. This is a wearable. You know why it's a wearable? Because I wear it. OK? Shirts, jeans, all of that stuff. And it got us to thinking that maybe that's what we could do. If I want a large surface area, what if I could embed it inside the clothing itself? And that became this project we called Jacquard. And we partnered with Levi's to do it. And what's interesting about it, and I can show you the tech here a little bit. So I can just touch the thing, and then you can see it can react. So I can make any surface you have into a virtual touch screen. And you may think, you know, other than it's kind of techy and cool, um, I'm, gonna ta I'm just going to assume the, the, the overwhelming silence is acceptance that you're stunned into coolness. But what's interesting to me about technology, I think technology becomes its most powerful when it's invisible. I think people want to live their lives. They want to be here, and they want to be in the moment. And they just want to be connected when they want to be connected. So we did this with Levi's because they said, we have people on bikes. And we don't want them, when a call comes in, we don't want them fumbling for their phone and looking at it and crashing. And what if you could just ride your bike and just simply touch your sleeve, change your song, listen to the YouTube t tune you're listening to, uh, dismiss a call if it's coming from me. You, know, you can just stop the call. You can do whatever it is that you want. And it's taken off. And it's amazing how many brands have gotten interested. We were talking to a snowboarding company uh, who make jackets. And they told me this, that every year at the bottom of ski slopes, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of cell phones. Because people stop snowboarding. They reach into their pocket. They have gloves on. They go to their phone, and it falls through. 
Which makes me think if this speech goes horribly wrong, I have a backup business. I think someone should go and collect those at the end of the year and then just sell them back to you. Um, <laughs> but the thought was, again, you could be there, you could be listening to your headphones and you can just touch it and you can move on. So that's one idea. Uh, and and uh, th this jacket actually went on sale. You can go to Levi's store, you can buy one because this is perfect jean jacket weather. Um, I would highly recommend one. The second thing we looked at was going the other way, which is, well, the awkward thing about this watch is that touching it is weird because my hand is bigger than the surface area. So that's problem number one. Problem number two, and this is sort of a jump, but hopefully you'll go with me. I think Google has made its money and, and its brilliance because it makes its software ridiculously smart. Like it's seriously, it's jaw-droppingly jaw smart. You type something into that search bar and it's wrong. Google doesn't care. It goes, I know what you meant. What you meant was a restaurant. And by the way, here are the reviews. And would you like me to make a reservation? Here are the directions. And you're just like, yes, that's great. But our hardware is fundamentally dumb. How many times have you ever picked up your, ever pick up your cell phone because you want to do it and it's on the lock screen? Whoever has wanted this? Or me, because my eyes aren't that great. I hold it up to look closer and the lock screen comes on. I'm like, or, or you can make the text bigger. Like, so I define intelligence as when something starts to anticipate your needs, right? So when something anticipates your needs, it seems really, really smart. So we thought about this for a long time and we realized that we can make this thing we call Soli. So this is a 60 gigahertz uh, Pico uh, radar on a chip. A lot of fancy words. Here's the easy way to think about it. Remember Minority Report? When Tom Cruise went psh, 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 and all the screens, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that was like the best Tom Cruise impression you have ever seen. But that's what it looked like, at least to me. Um, we reduced all that science fiction into science fact. And you can now control a device simply by radar. So as we approach the watch, it is seeing, it says, I see you coming, I see that you want to interact with me. As you get closer, I can give you the relevant data, I can show you whatever you want. So that's just sort of two examples of how it worked. Yeah, all right, we like it. So what I want to do is I want to keep this super short because I really, I have no idea what audiences want. Um, if I did, I'd probably, you know, be far more successful in life. So what I really want are questions. I want to talk about you. I want to talk about your things, things that you're worried about, things that you're interested in, and I will do my best to answer. Yeah. They're going to give you a mic. Thanks. Um, now you have power. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, do you regard games as products? Because what problem do games solve? Yeah, um, I absolutely think games are products. Um, so it's just funny, I don't know if you know, but um, I ran games for, um, for uh, Microsoft and DreamWorks. Uh, I built Medal of Honor, and then I actually had a game company here in France, and we took it public on the Nouveau Marché, the only French words I know, but it's useful. Um, so y you're, asking, you're definitely asking me, yeah, I think games are 100% products, but I think games are far more than products. I think games are both a product and a tool. So I think they're a product because you can obviously go back and, and buy a bunch of games and do stuff. But I think of them as a tool because I think when you're trying to teach people new technologies, games are better at teaching new technology than anything else we've ever used. And I think we actually underutilize them. I just think about this for a moment. When you have a massively multiplayer game and you have 10,000 people, bunch of kids from all over the world, different worlds, different languages. They are, here's what the task is. Imagine this task. The task is get together, get organized, learn some foreign spell and talk in a language you don't know, get a hundred of you to go complete a task. And they seem to be able to do it incredibly easily in games. And it seems to me it's the exact same thing. When I get into a car or I get anything else and I don't know how it works, that's crazy. So I, I'm a big believer of bringing game designers and I have two actually in my shop specifically to make on-ramping of technology both easier and more rewarding. There you go. If it's like a real simple game and I shipped, uh, I shipped products, games, and yeah. products that solve problems, but uh, I shipped also a really simple 8-bit game you have to touch like this, you know, just you don't learn anything from it. It's just stupid. And looking at your first point, what problem does it solve? Okay, I'll give you one. I'm really wondering. No, no, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. I'll give you one. So remember, not everything you do in life has to have purpose. Um, otherwise, no one would watch, uh, you know, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. But, um, so, but I will tell you where it does. So for instance, I, I was actually at Microsoft. And um, when Windows came out and the mouse came out, that was extremely difficult for people to understand what it was and how it worked. 
Uh, and in fact, you can see early video of people taking mice and putting it directly on the screen and moving it this way, right? And you all laugh, but it was like a new thing and it didn't make sense and you wanted to move that stupid arrow. And that actually is the reason, as I understand it, I'm quite sure it's true, the reason behind Solitaire and Minesweeper, right? Why did Microsoft come out with games? They did Solitaire and Minesweeper because it was the easiest, fastest way to teach you how to click, how to drag, and how to do these things. So things that may look simple with solving a real problem, it was just invisible to you. There you go. I have two minutes, which means like one good question or everyone can just get ice cream. Oh, there is a good question, all right. You're very bold, you've already assumed your question is good, which I like. I can't promise my answer is good. I don't know if it's good, I hope it is. <laughs> um, it was more in relation to the second project, the one with Levi's. Yeah. Um, in I, I'm a engineer for uh, kind of haptic sensors. Awesome. And I was wondering if, um, other than like the touch aspect, is Google considering uh, some sort of feedback that doesn't require you to look at your phone? Like how how are you going to be <laughs> able to to get around that? And I will give you the fifty dollars afterwards for the perfect question. There is a haptic sensor in the Jacquard jacket. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you ever want to come, we can demo it. Yeah, we have, a, we have a small haptic motor so that you can just do things by vibration. So when you're riding your bike, you can either do it with a light that has an LED or you can just do a buzz. It can also give you a buzz for incoming calls. Uh, we just partnered up with uh, one of the car driving services so that you don't have to keep looking at where, where is my fill in the blank. You can guess it's like one of two. Um, uh, and, you can, and you can see where it is. So I'm actually a huge believer and I think haptics are really underrepresented right now. And I think it's the, just the beginning of, of where we can go. And just another thing yeah. uh, is, is um, are you considering um, biofeedback? And so also like not only just touch, but what, uh, what other senses is Google considering? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll share one that, that I, I find really interesting. So recently we, we've had a lot of interest in, in healthcare and, and things like this, so, and fitness. So here's a very simple way to use haptics and, and, and biofeedback in, in a simple way. So, Let's assume that I need to be uh, running, and I'm not a runner, so if you're runners and I'm making up these numbers, like, have at me. Um, but let's say you're running about seven miles an hour, and let's say in order for you to be in better shape and where you want to go, you need to get to 7.4 miles an hour. I could do it the old way, which is like super annoying, which is beep, beep, beep. You're not running fast enough. Like, I have enough people in my life criticizing me, I don't need machines to add on, right? Or I could have this, and imagine I could do one of two things. One is I could give you a very subtle beep through the haptic device on it, and as humans, we will syncopate with that and we'll start to do it. I could also play it through your music. You're listening to your cool YouTube music, and I just speed up the beat a little bit. You will, all by yourself, start to do that. Um, the, here's the crazy experiment, and I, I've heard this. I don't know it's true, but I, I am absolutely going to do it to find out. I was talking to some professional runners at a, at a major sports brand, and they told me that if you're running at whatever it is, seven miles an hour, and you get tired, our, 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 our nature is to then slow down, because like, I'm going too fast, and I'm tired, and I'm exhausted. But it turns out that they believe that everybody has a particular resonance, and there's a particular speed in which you're more efficient, and that sometimes running a little bit faster, um, you might do better. So again, it would be really interesting with this biofeedback to say, hey, I'm actually going to speed you up to 7.2. You do your run longer, faster, get in better shape, and you don't do anything. So with that, I can answer questions afterwards, but this very nice lady will kill me. So, thank you. No problem.